Uh, it says she was, it was, she was very uh, promiscuous. She was an adulteress. So God, well, you know, amazing, before he even took his uh, wife, Homer was her name, that God told her that she was going to be an adulterous person, what she was going to do. And God also told um, Hosea why he wanted him to take this person as his wife. Because his life is mirroring exactly what is going on right now in the in the, um, in the Jewish and the Hebrew um, communities. We know at this time that, that the um, the kingdom is divided between the the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and the southern kingdom is Judah, and the northern kingdom is the ten the ten tribes in the north. So it's it's divided uh, during this time, and Hosea is in the in the northern kingdom. Um, so this 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 wife that God gave uh, uh, Hosea, you know, it, it's you know, in this book we talk about adultery. You need to remember that um, the Israelites, because of their disobedience, they didn't um, drive out all the inhabitants of the Promised Land, Canaan, like God told them. So all these people are among them now, and the Israelites have taken on the characteristics and the practices of all these heathen nations and. The A number one thing they're doing now is is adultery. They are doing that spiritual whoredom, and so that that um, term mentioned a lot. Uh, whoredom. They are they are prostituting them themselves, just like um, Gomer, uh, Hosea's wife is. And um, and last week we we got to the um, we saw it last week that you know uh, that uh, Gomer. She bore three children, and those three children had significant names because they meant something. It's like when all names in the Jewish community are meaning something. Those names meant something. We know that um, um, one child was named, one son was named uh, uh, Jezreel, and we know that one, that Jezreel was, was for, uh, it was, you know, the God was going to receive um, justice for something that had done a long time ago. And a little child was named. No Roma, that was the, the, the female, and her name meant no mercy. And then and the last son name was La Ami, which which meant that you are no longer my people. So those those three children mirrored exact those names mirrored exactly what the the Israel, Israel and the um, and Judah, what they were doing to God, how they had how they had turned away from God and took on the worship of all these false gods, all these false idols and everything they were doing that was that was angering, angering God and separating them from God. So when we got to them, I'm gonna jump to the last, the last end of uh, chapter one. When we saw at the end of chapter one, um, we saw that um, um, at verses like nine through 11, it, it told us that since the, the people, we were talking about Judah and Israel both at this time, the since they had pulled away from God or turned away from God, God was going to let them, God was going to let them turn, don't let them turn away from God was no longer going to bless them uh, anymore. We got to remember for this time, you know, everything they had, everything we have came from God. These were God's chosen people. And remember, he brought them to this land, Cana. This land was flowing with milk and honey. It had everything they needed uh, in it. All they had to do was to possess it. But he said that they were no longer be, they were no longer going to be his people. But there is going to come a time. But there will come a time afterward when the people would be called again uh, the sons of, of God. And then it was a time again when Judah and Israel will come together under one king. In the land, and it told us, and we talked about that last week. That that particular um, that particular uh, verse was foreshadowing to the future when uh, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come back again and unite the whole world is underneath underneath Him and His His just rule. So, with that, we're going to pull over to go over to chapter two. Remember, I said last week that we are going to. I do our best. We're going to do chapter two and three together. We're not going to try to, to go through and do our normal, normal, uh, uh, normal format and do um, every verse. 
Well, the reason I wanted to go back and do um, the last part of chapter one, because it leads right in to chapter, chapter two, especially um, when they talked uh, uh, about the, the nation and the country of the world come together under one, under one king. That's restoration, restore it back under one king. So if you would, turn to Hosea chapter two. And this particular uh, portion in chapter two is entitled punishment and restoration. You just look at, take those two words from themselves. You know, punishment. God don't punish us for just for no reason. He punishes because of the sins we commit. Same thing you do for your, you know, for your children. You you can you punish them or you chastise them or the errors and things they've done wrong so they can get correction. But it says restoration. Even though God is going to punish them, God has a plan to bring them back to Him, keep them in right standing, so they can so they can be called sons of God, so we can be called children of God. So, um, and what I, what I want to do is I want to I want to start off and, and read the verses that we're going to do together. So let's look at chapter two, just verse one, and it says, "Say ye." Say ye unto your brethren, uh, say ye unto your brethren, Annie, and to your sister, Ramala. So, so it says, say, and I want you to notice the change, the, the language change in there. It says, say unto your brethren, I said, brethren, speaking of relationship right there. Uh, Annie and say to your sister, Ramala. Comments. Anybody got a comment? I think God was just, I mean, I think Jose was just reminding them that, okay, this message wasn't just for one of them, it was for all of them. So I want to say to Go ahead. Uh, also, it sounds as though this verse connects with the last verse that we just read in verse, uh, I mean, in our chapter one, because the relationship has changed but, and, and said, your brethren, I believe I have the King James here, said your brother and your sister. So it sounds to me as though there has been a connection there with God. When you look at the very last verse, um, last verse in uh, chapter one, where it's talking about the, the people coming, Israel coming together and they will be as one. Yeah, it sounds yeah. as though there has been a relationship there in verse one to me. That's exactly, that's exactly the response I was um, looking for. If you would, look on, the, look on the screen. It says, when the general restoration of the Jewish nation took, takes place, you may change your language in addressing those brothers and sisters whom were previously before disowned and may the, and they call them uh, Ami, my people, not Lo Ami. Remember last week, and the, the name Lo Ami meant not my people. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, Ro, Ro, Omi, he that hath obtained mercy, not no Ro, not Lo Ami, no more mercy. You see the change. You see the change in there right now, um, uh, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Griffin was uh, totally correct. So that's those two verses go together. But you see the rest. You see the restoration there from from chapter in chapter one to to the first verse in chapter two. Now they're called differently. Now they are they are called. They're part of God's family. Now they do. They now are my people. And now God does have mercy because that's been because this verse speaks of. Restoration, um, right there. You mean restore it back to God. Okay. Let's, okay. Okay. I want. We're gonna, we're gonna throw up, throw up something. Minister Allen, Minister Allen said, she said, Jezreel, my souls, Loroni, no mercy. Lo Ami, not my people. So we saw, ridiculously, we saw that in verse uh, one, the names changed. That low, the low was taken off, was gone. It was no more low. 
because of that would be restoration back to God. God again. Okay, let's look at let's look at verses two, three, two. Pull up the next slide. Two, three, and two, three, and four. Two, three, and four. And it says, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredom out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and set her in the day that she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of order. So, first, first, I want to call you. First, I want to call your attention to that first word, plead. No, look at how you know. You see on the screen. You see the definitions of plead. I got uh, beg, appeal, beseech, implore. So, if you look at side pocket, this is. This is um, this is God talking here. This is a tone for God. This is this is God saying this. He's saying, "Plead, you know, to talk. Remember that this is this is um, uh, also um, you're talking about uh, Hosea's life. So this, what God is saying, parallels Homer's life. Remember, remember that uh, uh, Dolma was a uh, she. She was very promiscuous." She had an unsavory lifestyle. So he says, plead with your mother. Plead with Gomer. He says, plead, for she is not my wife. Re re remember when we were talking that in this instant, God is, a, God is the father, the husband, and we, the church, are, are the bridegroom. So he says, so he's saying she is, that relationship has been broken. He says, neither am I her husband. So he's telling, he's talking about Israel right here, to put away her whoredom. So when you can take that, take uh, Hosea and Gomer out, you can substitute Israel right there. So God is, is telling uh, uh, the tribes of, uh, when I say Israel, I mean uh, the northern tribe and the southern tribe, to tell them that they are no longer his, no longer his people because they have went after idols. They have turned him aside to worship um, to worship idols, they put them in, they put them in his place. So if you look on the screen, it says, Hosea brings charges against Homer for her physical immortality, and the Lord brings charges against Israel for her spiritual immortality. That's the idol worship. When you see that, that plead, plead um, word, what do you think about when you see that word plead? Now you see it, we see it twice right there in, in the first verse. I can tell you what I think about. I think about uh, a court. When we have lawyers in court, they all plead in their case for their defendant. So in this instance, if you look at two, this is God. God pleading his God pleading his case to to the people and telling them uh, what they should do, what should turn back from it. So. Um, I'm sorry, I just took in. Anybody, anybody have a comment out there on those um, three verses? Yes. Yeah. When, you, when you look at the text, you, you hear me? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Uh, two, three, and four. Gomer and the, her actions parallel the actions of Israel. They basically did not follow the guidelines they had agreed to with the covenant that was with God. Gomer did the same thing with Hosea. She violated the marriage. She did everything that she wasn't supposed to do, which parallels what Israel was doing with the Lord. So now, judgment is going to come upon them. And that's what this whole thing is about. Hosea, life parallel what was going on with Israel. Hosea's life. Hosea, excuse me. Not Hosea's life. Gomer. Gomer. Thank you. <laughs>
Anybody else out there with a comment? No, in verse three, where God said, "Less," I mean, when He said, "Less," I script her naked, and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and, and slay her with thirst. Um, God is reminding them that He, unless they change, He was going to take them back to the way they were before. Amen. He was going to take everything that He gave them. He was going to take it back again, and they were going to be worse off, really, than where they were before. <laughs> Amen. Anybody else out there with a comment? Also, you look, look on your on your screen. Uh, it says naked, as in the day she was born, wilderness and dry land and thirst. If you go back to uh, when uh, the nation of Israel was down in Egypt, uh, that's their condition. That's how they were. That's their state. How they were, and they were down when they were down in Egypt. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a wilderness. It was a foreign land to them, and they were, they were thirsty, I mean, for, for God. They needed, they needed God in their life, and what God do? God sent Moses down, down there to, um, to um, deliver them, to bring them out. So as Sister Graves said, God say, keep on acting up. I'm gonna put you back to that, that time before. You remember how it was back then, how needy you were, how thirsty you were when you were calling out to me. And also look in, in verse four when, it's, when he says that I will have no more mercy upon her children. And what he's, he's saying right there, he's talking about the generations there, thereafter, those to come afterwards. We got to look, look at something from uh, chapter one we studied uh, last week. That one, oh, it could have been, could have been Sunday school, but uh, when they talked about, it, they didn't teach their children anymore. All they taught them was the same thing that they're doing. So they didn't, they didn't teach. Them. Little children didn't know. So, so that bad behavior, that sin, just went on, was passed on from generation after generation. That the, all, all the generations were doing the same thing. So God said He was, He was no longer going to have mercy, you know. Or upon them. He's going to take his hands. He's going to take his hand off them because they are the children of whoredom. Just say because they are the children that practice idolatry. They are the children that only know, or the generations thereafter, they only know about the false gods. They only know to, to pray to the to the uh, symbols of what, what a god is supposed to be, not the one true god. Well, let's Let's move on. Let's go. Let's move on to verses five and seven. Okay, here in five and here in five and seven, five and seven, five and seven says, For the mother has prayed, for their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them has done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that, shall, that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband. But then was it better with me than now. Comments? You know, this is just like a, a, a backslider. You know, they, um, they went out to the streets. Um, they did what they had to do. And then they figured, they said, I had it better when I was serving the Lord. So I think that she's she's making a reverse there. She knew she had it when she was gone, when she had the love with she mm -hmm. had it. Anybody else out there with a comment? Anybody else out there with a comment? Let me look on Facebook. I can't read it. <laughs> it, it it's kind of like a person that's on drugs. And I'm talking in terms of uh, Goma now. Mm -hmm. it, it, she, you, we can see where she turned back to her old ways again and she's and and that's what we do with god we we we, we repent and then we go back 
to what we were doing all over again. And that's what I, I kind of relate that to a person that's on drugs. That's just my uh, perception of it. I see that um, that the Lord is um, just letting them know that this is how this is how Israel acted. You know, they they followed after they went out and prostituted themselves with um, with the um, with the the people of the land. They weren't told they were told not to mix with them, but yet they married. They intermarried. They gave their sons and their daughters. So now they they had children while they were while they were out here doing this prostitution. And he's saying, and they ran after, after they hungered and they, they, they loved worshiping these other gods and, and, you know, with, and being intermingled with, with the, um, with them. And they, they prayed to those gods for what they got, you know, for their food and their shelter and their clothing and their olive. And they just, just like the, just like the people did, they prayed um, to other gods, you know, how the sun God and the moon, whatever they did. They did it. Israel did it. They they ran after them, doing, and then after they got out there and things got got bad, then they realized that um, they needed to go back. You know, they were at the point where they found out that when they couldn't, I guess when they couldn't really um, find these other the other lovers, like when you can't find when you want something and you can't really get to it, then then you realize well the grass is not always greener on the other side. Yeah. So the grass not greener. So now they're ready. Now, now he's um, allowing them to feed, allowing them or her, Goma, whichever one, because we know that she's parallel, parallel in the life of the Israelites, to real to realize. Look, this this is not all what I thought it was going to be while I'm out here. I truly, I truly need to go back to my husband, or go back to my first love, uh, go back to God, because he was the one that was taking care of me all the time. So. I need to go back, whether she stays there or not. But she did at at this point. He, Israel, he's telling Israel they're gonna see that they need to turn around and come back to God. I'm, that's how I'm looking at it, anyway. Anybody else out there with a comment? You know, I think this is um what we say in the military. This is SOP, Standard Operation Rating Procedure. Whereas this is nothing new for Israel. They do this over and over. So this is uh, not a surprise. When you, when you look at verse 7, it parallels with the term repentance. So in order for her to come back to her new her husband, Gomer, and if you look at the same way the nation of Israel come back to God, you have to repent. Time got too hard. They couldn't deal with it the other way. So the only way to come back into the house is to repent. Thank you. All right. <laughs> and, and verse six says that you know, the, I'm reading from the James, uh, King James. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her path. So if she doesn't repent. He's going to make it so it's going to be so hard for her that she, there's nothing else that she can do but come back to him. And God, he makes it hard for us at times to put thorns in our way so that we can come back to him because he cares for us. Amen. I have a question. Can everyone, everyone see Minister Allen's comment? No, what is it? It says, this is talking about the, when I asked the person about plea, it says, it's like a lost family member. That you know need to be saved because they are on a wrong path. You plead, you plead, you plead. Amen. Her balance of amen. <laughs> put, put, bring the slide back up. And, and, and relation and the explanation for verses um, uh, five and five and seven. Of course, we know we're talking about we're talking about um, a Goma right here because she's the, she's the one that's been out prostituting herself and it says that she's praising her lovers we can just put that in there as he is praising her lovers for what they have provided for her. she so she's saying they have provided what she needs for life her food her shelter her clothing you can just turn that around and say that the nations the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom is out praising false god namely uh ball here now ball is the is the is the um he is a 
he is the Canaanite God or, or that, that's prominent in this area here. So they are praising this, they are praising this, this Canaanite God for providing the senses of life, the things they need, their food, their shelter, their clothing. When we started talking about the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the wool, the flax, and the, the oil, and all those, and the bread. Those are things that God provides, but they are turning to Baal, the Canaanite God, God who has no no substance. He's just a <laughs> he's just something. You know, you think about it in your own mind. Something they they are they say he's the sun god. Well, who made the sun? <laughs> a God Almighty made the sun, but they have substituted this other entity. And when that's against, you know, they're not supposed to um, put any God before God, put anything before God. So, so that's what he's talking about there. It says, um, therefore, God will lay thorns. Those thorns, it says, in their path, troubles. Could be any type of, any kind of stumbling box that's going to make them turn around. So God going to put things in their path to make them come back to, as um, um, Dr. Griffin said, to make them rethink their, their uh, attitude and come back to him. You know, just God put stuff in there so they, yeah. they still ain't thinking to say, well, hey, I was a lot better off where I was. was. Yeah. When I was with God than I am with with this God, Ball. Ball can't do nothing for him. He can't bless him. He can't give him nothing. He can't give him nothing. But with God, they had prosperity. From, the, from when God first created the earth up until this point. They can't lay, no, can't put their finger on nothing that any false God ever done for them. It's all been Lord God that has given them the blessings, given them everything, even the, the things they need to live. It's, it's been God. And they have turned away from that. You know, look at look at our the world today, the situation that, that we, we live in. You know, it, uh, we may have been even been that way one time. You know, in our in our lives, we didn't we didn't turn to God and thank God for for what we had, what we're doing, or even for the you know the little bit that we may have had. We thought we didn't have nothing, but we could have not had nothing. But I saw fit to give us. You know, if if we only had bread and water, God saw fit to give us bread and water because it took care. of of a need. And we have to look at it that way, when we weren't hungry, when we weren't thirsty. You know, God saw fit to put someone in our path to give us shoes when we didn't have shoes. Or give us the clothes when we didn't have clothes. Or even offer us a meal when we didn't have that. It may not have been nothing elaborate. God didn't say he was going to give us lobster and shrimp all the time. He said he was going to supply our needs when we truly need and truly ask, ask for that. And we are to thank him for that, give him the reverence and respect that he deserves. Not some, not some picture of, of a wooden stick that's supposed to represent God. So they have done, they have done this. But just like Gomer, Gomer comes to her mind was, you know, I'm going to go back to uh, Hosea. It was a lot better with Hosea than I'm out here now. Maybe she didn't got to a point now with. The love she's been she's been following after, not giving them what she needed, not not not, not, yeah, not taking care of her. Needs, her real needs. But they said taking care of her real needs. She's not getting it. So what she was getting it from, she was from getting it from the true husband, the one that God had given her to take care of her. Just like um, Israel, God had uh, taken care of the nation of Israel, the Southern Kingdom, and and the Northern Kingdom, he taking care of everything, you know, even, even when they were naughty and disobedient. Okay, so anybody else want to comment before we move over? Okay, before 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 we move over, now in in this last this last section five through five through seven, we saw we saw what God has was given to Israel. Now I want to. I want to go with to another reference in the Second King 17, Second Kings chapter 17, 7 through 17. It lists 
all the sins that Israel, some of the sins that Israel is guilty of. And we know that a lot of this time is parallel in Kings and Chronicles and, and some, the minor prophets and the major prophets. They're, they're, um, some of the timelines are right long together. So some of these events may be mentioned in, in Kings or Chronicles or, or some of the other uh, prophets. Okay. But if you look on your screen, and this and this um, and this version, I don't think this is this is not the King James. This is not the King Ver King James version. You're going to be seeing from Second Kings 17. It's listing the the sins that Israel was committing, and it says all this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshiped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord, their God, that were not right. From watchtower to fortified cities, they built themselves high places in, high places in all their towns. They set up sacred stones and asteroid poles on very high hills and under every spreading tree. At every high place, they burned incense as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things that aroused the Lord's anger. They worshiped idols, though the Lord had said, you shall not do this. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, turn from your evil ways, observe my commands, and decree in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant that he had made with their ancestors and the statutes he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them to not do as they do. They, for, they forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and an asteroid pole. They bowed down to all the starry hosts and they worshiped Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. They practiced divination and they sought omens and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. So these are some of the sins that Israel was guilty of, of committing. So I wanted to, um, to uh, bring those forward so we can, we're, we're reading these um, uh, minor prophets that we know exactly, you know, and, precisely some of the things that uh, that they were doing. But you know, it's in, in, in those um, scriptures I read, in several spots it said God had told them not to do it. That's direct disobedience to what God had commanded. You know, you know, you know when during this time there was also um, an old tradition passed down, but, but God wrote the Ten Commandments on hands. He gave them that, you know, he said, prophets and um, men to uh, let the people know what thus said the Lord. So God, never no time that God did not leave them without a word, but the people chose. They chose not to follow after God, just like people today. People today, you can plainly see God in everything we do <laughs> out there in that rain that was just coming down a little while ago. That's God, but they chose not to see God, not to follow after God, just like people chose today. They chose to ignore God. And just like we saw in today, that, that, um, we saw that it's come a time when God goes going to say, oh, you want to be in your mess? I'm going to leave you in your mess. You are no longer, you are no longer my people. But we know we're talking about restoration also, but there's going to be a time that uh, the Israelites are going to be identified with God again. They are going to be called his people again, just like we are going to be restored when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Amen. Okay, that's that. Okay, so that's that portion. Anybody got a comment? No, you did great. 
Okay, that was pretty, I know that was, that was pretty long. So let's go to, the, let's go over to verse is, verse is 8 to 13. We going, we going right along. We might make it through this. We just might make it through. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, Deacon Davis going to read verses 8 through 13 for us. <laughs> I, I'm working, baby. I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do this stuff. I got. I got it. Hey, Put me to work. Uh, two, eight, two, thirteen, and, uh -huh. and it reads: For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine mm. and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Mm. Therefore, will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. Through what? 13. 13. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she has said, these are my rewards that my lovers have given me, or my little gods. I'm sorry, that's not written there, but I'm. And I will make them a forest and the beasts of the field shall eat them. 13. <clears throat> and I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers and forgot me, said the Lord. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot there. Basically, as we already been saying, God, 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 you got fed up. I got fed up. Talk about her lovers. Talk about her cars, her houses that she got, her bank account, uh, her job, her friends, her uh, extracurricular activities that they that we do that takes us away from church. It takes us away from our God. All these little G's, like she had with Balaam and all and and all that other stuff. When you forget about it, because you think about it, all the things God gave her, she was using to, and sacrifice to, <laughs> to these little G's. And God just decided he was fed up with it and, and, and going to take, take it all back, as Israel did. I'm sorry, I brought it back to current day. Amen. I think that w exactly what uh, Deacon Tyrone was saying is that um, Israel uh, was not giving God the credit. You know, he was not getting credit for for what he had, what he was doing for them. They were so engrossed and so so involved in serving Baal and these other gods that everything they got, everything they possessed, they gave the credit to the Baal, you know, and the the gods and the the Shira pulp, whatever they were worshiping, they gave all the credit to them. Forgot all about God, which is how why they were there. They forgot all about him. So it's it's just saying to us today, if we the things that God bless us with, we need to acknowledge the fact that God has given it to us. You know, we 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 work hard or if we got jobs and we are able to get up and go to our jobs and work, but we need to praise God for that because without God we're not able to do it. So that's the main thing I think that he's trying to point out in these verses to to Israel to um to um Israel is that you didn't do these things by yourself. I did it for you. But you gave the credit to Baal for doing it. And since you gave the credit to Baal, I'm going to let you show, I'm going to show you just who Baal is. And I'm going to take all that stuff that you said that Baal gave you and Baal allowed you to have and Baal allowed, that he allowed you to do. I'm going to take it from you. And, and, um, You'll see then that it wasn't he that gave it to you, because when I, because when I take it away, and you go to pray to Baal to get it back, you're not gonna get it back because Baal can't give it to you. He didn't give it to you to 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 begin with. So 
So I'm thinking that's what he's just showing in those verses that they, for, they forget about God. And you know, sometimes we get um, we get so caught up in everyday life and things that's going on around us and how we may be blessed or not blessed, and we forget that it's all because of God. We can't do anything. We have what we have because of God. Um, and that there's nothing too hard for him, and he's the one that do, you know, do all the blessings. And we may not mean to, but sometimes we forget to give God the give God the credit for where we are, and and, and then we'll end up like Israel here, right here. We may not be praising other gods, but but we have a brand new car, so now we're too busy washing our car, so we can't get to church or whatever, you know, stuff like that. You don't give God. I'm saying the main thing, I guess, is that they weren't giving God credit for what God do, so He was gonna let them know that He was the one that was responsible for all that they had. Amen. Amen. And speaking of that car, like you said, you uh, uh, you sit there, you got that big 55-inch uh, TV up there, Super Bowl, or some fight or something come on when you should be out there doing some type of service for God, but you do that, but you forget why you have it, Amen. how you got it. Amen. And, and, and all we got to do is we got to remember to give, give, give the praise and the glory where it's due, where it's due, and understand why we got what we have, why are we so blessed. In whatever we're in, and like uh, Sister David said, whether it be uh, in the midst of the valley or on the top of the mountain, wherever it is, we always got to give him praise. Because if we're in the midst of the valley, that means we still here. We still here, and like like he's doing them now. He still loves us enough to chastise us, because that means he wants us back. That means he wants us back. He doesn't want. Is we're not. He's not done with us yet, and that's a blessing in itself. Think about that. That's a blessing in itself. I'm sorry. Anybody else with a comment? Yes. That takes me back to the mid-60s, and there was a hit song called You Don't Miss Your Water Till Your Well Run Dry. Mm -hmm. What well, is parallels that in a sense? Because you had all of these things going for you. Now, all of a sudden, you got nothing going for you. So now you're missing it. You have to turn around and look and see what you did wrong. And collect yourself to go in the direction that you need to go, which is the direction is the Lord. He's the one that gave it to you to begin with. Amen. And I like the fact that he's going to expose who Ball is. Yeah. You know, if, if Ball gave it to you, let's see if he, I'm going to take it from you, but let's see if Ball can give it back to you. And mm. that's where the fix came in at. So. Ball and all, all it was who he was cranked up to be. I'm going to read. Allen says, when we get caught up in stuff and forget who gave it to us, it, diminish, it diminishes the big G and glorifies the little G. God is a jealous God. We are his and he will let it be known. Amen. Amen. Shows me, man. Hey. Oh, uh, Sister Barrow says amen. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, you know, great comments that you uh, that you all had, but um, what we had, whether it's material wealth or just just the necessity, just the necessities of life, God give it to us. And you know, we see in in Israel, we just focus on Israel a little, a little bit. God gave them in instances more than material. He gave them some, He gave them some uh, some luxuries of life. You know, also he gives us the luxuries of life just sometimes because we ask for him because he wants us, he wants us to have them to make our life better. But we get those things, we are to realize where they come from and to know that God did not have to do that. God did not have to give Israel that gold and silver that he gave. He didn't have to make them wealthy. Remember when he brought them out of um, Egypt, he he gave them things that they, you know, the, he gave them the clothes from the Egyptian. He gave them gold and silver from the Egyptian. And he also, from the land, he gave them um, vineyards. They didn't have to plant. <laughs> so he gave them uh, everything they needed. But we are to realize that where it comes from. When we get to, we get to old Gomer, you know, at, at, at this part, we're talking about her, where she seemed to, she seemed to, she didn't realize that everything that she, that she needed, she owned, it came from her husband. Go away. It didn't come from her lovers. Amen. Just like Israel, everything they need came from God. It didn't come from it didn't come from from Baal or Balaam or any of those other Canaanite gods that were out there because they could not do that. They're not real. 
spirit. They're not real. You know, we make us as people, we make things our our gods. God. It's like they had made them their gods, the tradition of what God is. They are not real. Can't do nothing for us but bring us down and away from the real uh, true God. All right. Nobody else have a nobody else have a comment. We're gonna go on to verses. We're gonna do uh, verses 14 through 14, 14 through 17. Uh, let me see. Uh, Sister Melanie, are you out there? Yes. You got the, you have the uh, voice of an orator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you do. So you said uh, 14 through? 17. We need those first together. All right. Now my, I uh, have the NLT um, translation. But then I will win her back once again. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her there. I will return her vineyards to her and transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. She will give herself to me there. And she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from her captivity in Egypt. When that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of my master. O Israel, I will wipe the many names of Baal from your lips, and you will never mention them again. So we're still looking at um, restoration. Yes, like restoration. Dick says we're looking at at the, the Lord. My this section is entitled in my book, "The Lord's Love for Unfaithful Israel." He still loves them, so he's ready to um, put put it, put this out here so that hopefully that he'll be able to win. It says, but then I will win her back again. He they will turn back to him when they see that Baal can't do for them what they thought Baal was doing for them. And then he was letting them know that, you know, he's going to give them all that he promised. He's going to um, turn back and uh, um, do for them like he did for them when they when he freed them from Egypt, when he took them out of captivity in Egypt when they were, when they were young. He and they will be able to um, acknowledge the fact that he is who he is, that he is God, and that they belong to him. And, and Baal won't be anything to them anymore. They won't care about Baal anymore. So this is what his his future plan is, what he's working on is to get them back, to bring them back and to, um, back to the Lord. Anybody else out there but what comment? It ties into the last, the last set of verses where he was telling them about um, all the things that they were doing and who Baal and how they were worshiping Baal. And how he was going to expose Baal because now it's he's it, it, it gotten to the point to where he's telling them, okay, um, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to show you all the things that you did wrong, but I'm going to bring you back. And when I bring you back, you won't even know who Baal was. I'm going to bring you back so well that you, you um, all thoughts of Baal are going to vanish from your head. I, that's, that's that's what I'm thinking. Okay, when you talk when you talk in verse 14. When he talks about the valley of uh, uh, sure. Achor, there we gotta go back to the, we gotta go back to the time when uh, when, when Joshua was there and the, and the children of uh, Israel conquering the land. You remember the time when they had that uh, that the soldier named Achor? He took some he took some stuff he wasn't supposed to take. He brought it in the tent, right? And they, lose, and they were losing it. They kept losing, and Israel kept losing. They kept losing. They get defeated. They mm -hmm. couldn't figure out why. Until God told them what what Achor had did, he had taken I think it was some jewel or something or some spoils from the uh, uh, from the enemy. He had buried it in the tent. And that's why and that's why yeah. a, that's why they kept losing their battles because of that because of that disobedience. So what oh, God so what God did right there oh, he uh, he was judged he was punished and they were brought back. He got rid of got rid of that what God had told them not to bring back in there. They they killed him. He was he was put to death. But God told him to get to get that sin out of there. Out of the camp. Take it out. Because that was holding them holding them down. Holding them back. So God is says he's gonna do the same thing with Israel just like he did in the valley of Achor. He's gonna bring them back to where they where they should where they should be. When he bring them back 
it's going to restore that restore that relationship. So, um, well, we, well, he will be the husband, the husband in the marriage, and we, just like Israel, we will be the wife, the faithful wife, not the not the adulterous, dishonest wife, the faithful, the faithful wife. And mm-hmm. we won't be, we won't, we won't associate him with, with or his rulership with, with Baal, the tying down, the holding down, or the servitude uh, anymore. And uh, and he's also he he said this hope, this hope. You see a definite change from from um, from verses eight to thirteen to verses fourteen to seventeen. The change, the tone changes right, right there. This is what God done. This is how God is going to restore, bring the people back. You know, it's never God has never left. You know, um, He left him. Yeah. Israel's left him. So this is how He's going to get us, get us back. You know, he goes here and plainly reveal who ball is. You know, we, there's a lot of balls, <laughs> a lot of balls in our in our lives. He just reveal them. You know, he can't do anything for for him. If you think about um, also back in the time when uh, uh, when Elijah <laughs> when Elijah was when Elijah was out and Elijah came up against the the priest uh, the priest the king. Uh, they had. What happened to them? <laughs> he called down fire. That destroyed all of them. God destroyed all of them. Mm-hmm. Ball couldn't do nothing. He couldn't stand against the true. He couldn't stand against the one true God because he is not real. I think it 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 um, it's worth repeating again and again. He they are not real. Mm-hmm. And I like also that he says. Um, in the beginning of it, when he said, I'll take, when he said, I'll win them back, but he said, I'll lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to there. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes God got to take us, you know, someplace where th- we're no distractions, where he can really talk to you. You know, you got to get you off by yourself, but maybe you really listen. So he said, I'll talk tender. I'll speak tender to her there out in the desert. You know, you out there, there's nobody out there, but you in the desert and the dry. So you can't, I won't say you won't, but Pretty much, you can't help but hear the Lord. But sometimes, when you get to get to an issue, you know, you brought so low, it's like, who else you gonna listen to but God? And he's and he's talking to you. So I see where he's trying to. He says, "I will get her back once again." But that's what he got. He's got to take them to the desert. He's gonna do all these things to them to take them down, so that they will see that they need the Lord and will be able to listen to what He has to say in order to get them to come back. And then uh, I like in verse 16 where it goes and says, In that day I declare that you will call me husband, you will no longer call me master. The relationship shifts. Um, a ma- you know, a master is one thing. He's, he's overbearing. He could be over you. And you got to do what he says. But a husband, the relationship is a much more tender and loving relationship. Um, at least that's what I feel. Don't you feel that way? I love <laughs> Yes, yes, husband. (laughs) A wife was just saying in that other house. uh, What 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 God does is He takes those 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 little guys that we have, as as she was talking about, and make them insignificant. That's how He breaks us down and gets us to where where they're not as important as we thought they were. Yeah. When we get in those situations, it's not that we may not have them. Sometimes he takes them, away. he allows them to be taken away from us. Yeah. But sometimes it just gets in a situation where they're not as important to us anymore. Let's take the events of the last two weeks. I don't know about you all, but watching the news, uh, when all the looting and the burning was going on, it it, it brought brought you back to a place where all this stuff that we have became unimportant anymore. It became, we need God as, as, a, as a people. And when I talk about the people, I'm talking this world. Mm-hmm. That we need to go back to our first love and get rid of all this other stuff. And, that, and, and that's what he does. He'll make this stuff, these things insignificant, like Baal and all these other, uh, like when Pharaoh was trying to uh, say, okay, I got this guy, why my God ain't doing this? I got a musician. Why that ain't working? He'll make those things to the point where you you have no choice. The only thing is working is God. Is God. So that's what he'll do Amen. with those. Amen. One of the things, one of the things you have to, one of the great lessons 
about these first three chapters are, is that it shows how easily we become complacent in serving God. And it shows us that when we're not, con we're not content with God, we're not content with anything else in life. Mm -hmm. Gomer and the Israelites, they really didn't know what they wanted. They were glad. They were glad to have been brought out of slavery. They were glad, glad to have been been set free, and God blessed them. And one of the things about it is when the when the best when the blessings are flowing, we tend to lose sight of who provides those blessings, and we just take it for granted. Amen. Okay. So they didn't know what they wanted, and God said, "I'm going to bring you back, but I'm going I'm 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 going I'm going to bring you back in a certain way." It wasn't that he was going to give her or the Israelites all that they wanted and let them run, run rampant and sin all over the world. But he said, I'm going to take you out into the desert and let you really understand that you really understand that the blessings that, that you have had, I provided them. The blessings that you want, you're going to, I'm the one that's going to make it so. And that's what it teaches us is that we have to learn to be content with what God has already given us. Yes. Because if we don't, we'll become complacent and we'll lose sight of God. Mm. Yeah, uh, Sister Pierrefort said, it is a beautiful thing when you know where your help comes from. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And knowing this, this desert that um, the, in Scripture is talking about here for the Israelites, God's talking about captivity here. He's going to put them under captivity. We know he put them on the captivity a number of times. He's gonna put them on the captivity so they they're gonna call it to God so they can um uh, go through some stuff and go through that go through that valley so they can come back, come back to God. You know, sometimes God gotta do the same thing. He gotta bring us, he gotta knock us down off our pedestal, Amen. bring us low, so we can come back, so we can come back to him. Sister Davis, I feel that's what's going on now. We have COVID-19, and then we have George Floyd. We have all this stuff going on. I think we've strayed too far away, and something had to change to bring us back to God because he just wasn't pleased with the way things are going. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. I, I, I think that. I ain't say it, but I think that. Should tell my hear I think that. God got to get, get our attention somehow, just like he's trying to get the Israelites' attention. Amen. If we don't get them our attention, it's for our destruction. It's like it's going to be for their destruction. We're the ones that are going to be lost. It's like they're going to be lost. Okay. Uh, We're good. Uh-oh. Speaking David was telling me it's 804. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. <laughs> Uh -oh. Okay, we go on to we go on to the next portion. We go we go on should be at eighteen through something. I just read to seventeen, so okay. We go at eight three. We we're at eighteen through eighteen through twenty. It says, and in that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the flocks with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. You hear? And we see this the Lord's patrol, he's talking about uh, a linkage, a marriage. You think about it in the Israelites' time, that patrol, you know, that was over a long period of, of time. They were first patrolled before they were married. They, were, they had that, that uh, commitment first. So what God says, he's, gonna, he's going to make a covenant <laughs> for his people. He said he's going to make it with the, he gonna make it with the, um, the beasts of the fields. And with the files of the earth and with the creeping things, he doing all this for his people. He says he's going to break the sword and the battle out of the earth. So they don't have to fight no more. He's going to do all this for his people when they come back, you know, to get them, to get them back. He's doing this for uh, their safety. And he, and he says that he will betroth thee unto me for 
ever. So it's going to be a marriage between God and his people. God, the, the, the righteous husband, and us, the church, the, faith, the faithful wife. So he's going to do that. Um, he's going to do it forever. And he says he's going to be the husband of, of judgment, uh, righteousness, loving kindness, and of mercies. And he says we, we are going to be the, um, the wife of faithfulness. So there will be no, no adulterous, no more um, adulterous relationship, no more turning to turn away from to other things and leaving God out. We're going to look to God for, for everything and not pray to the moon and the stars, but pray to the one true God, because the one true God is the only one that can make things happen. Right. He's the only one can make the uh, make the star make the star shine and the moon not shine. So, so he's saying that he is he is in this particular verse is going to be the true the true husband, and we are going to be um, the true uh, true wife. And you can you can if you go to that uh, verse and put Homer and and um, and uh, um, Hosea. In there, he's talking about that relation also will be restored because you know Jose's life is is mirroring what's going on right now in um uh, in Israel. So he said he he is going he is going to um he is going to correct his people, and you know and and uh, for creation he gonna make that covenant with creation for his for his people. You know that that God put man and uh, dominance over. Over the animals and the beasts out there, so he's gonna make a he's gonna make a covenant with them to benefit to benefit human beings because he because he loves us just that much. It says God will draw Israel to Him again. God punishes His own when they have sinned, but He is quick to forgive and to restore them. Amen. Thank you. And I'm saying, he, he, <laughs> it says He's like a loving parent who whips the child who's mischievous. But then gives him, but then forgives him and restores him because he's his own. Don't we do that? Have we done that? You know, in our, in in our lifetime, yes. Spring him on one hand and, say, and give him a hug with the other hand and, and tell him that we love him yes. because because they are our own. Because we want we want to correct, we want them to correct them and realize them and let them know why we are doing this. Right, this right, is the same thing, right, right. The same thing. What God has for. Hard for half for the Israelites for his people. It says God is once again urging his people to worship him for who he is and not to be ruled by false gods. Look at that word it says ruled by false gods. That means for everything they do and they're like, don't look, don't look to the sun and the moon for your blessings. Right. Look to look to God. You know, in the previous verse before, when they were praying to the sons of the moon, God said He was going, He was going to take away all, take away all the, um, the, uh, of the elements, the, 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 the sun, the rain, all the things that were going to nourish, going to nourish the, um, uh, the crops, or the vineyards. So, so they wouldn't have it. We'd have to come back to Him. And let them know that it don't work. That stuff <laughs> don't work. <laughs> it's just a covenant. When God's people become subject to God and creation become <laughs> the covenant that God was talking about in the verses that we read about when God said he will make a covenant with uh, creation. So God's people become subject to God and creation becomes subject to the people in those um, uh, verses we were talking about. Did anyone else have a comment about that particular the section of those three verses? Um, all right then. Okay. If not, we're gonna go back to oh, go, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Verse 18. It reminds me of the covenant that he made to put all the beasts, animals, creeping things where he wanted them. Now, if you look at it right to this very day, man thinks it's smarter than everybody has decided to move certain animals to certain places, not where God put them. Hmm. <laughs> in my research, God put animals and put things that can control those animals where he wanted them. So in other words, one animal survived by devouring another animal. Controls basically what God did. 
Now, what you notice man did, they put animals anywhere they want them, fish anywhere they want them, frogs, rats, and they're creating havoc on this world because that's not where God put them. Even on the Everglades right now, they got snakes running up there <laughs> devouring everything. But God knew exactly what he was doing. And he says it right here in this verse. He did it. But man, they're shorter and they're moving them. Think about that. <laughs> Uh, let me, let me see. This is what Sister per Perifor said. Uh, no, let's all, we all read. It's the same comment. That's the same comment. So, yeah, well, let's let's look at look at the, let's look at the last three verses. It says, "And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear," saith the Lord. I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear. Jezreel, and I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her uh, that had not her, upon her that had not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which have not, I'm sorry, and I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. You know, in those, those last three verses, you see right there, Another shift, another change in relationship between between God and His people. He said they don't come. They gonna come. A, there is gonna come a time, and we talked about Jezreel. That was a time when, when God said He was gonna put everything uh, back like it should be. When He He avenged um, a murder in in, in Jezreel. And God said He's gonna put everything back. He says the earth shall the earth shall. He, it's gonna come a time back when He said He took all those things away. Right. That 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 um that the Israelites had, they're gonna be a time he's gonna give them back. Yeah, yeah. He's gonna give them back to Israel, he's gonna give them back to us because the relationship has been restored. It's kind of it's come back. God's not gonna give it back to him. He don't have a relationship. He's gonna give it back because the people have come back to him. So then it's like God gives us, you know, uh he'll come back, we come back to him. He give us the, the things that we need to sustain us. We're talking about we talking about the corn, the wine, the oil, and the thing. That's talking about the things that sustain it, the food, the shelter, and the clothing. He'll, he'll give those things uh, back. It won't be hard for them to get those things uh, uh, anymore. And he says he's going to sow on the earth. He's going to make the earth prosper again. He gonna, in my previous verses, what he said, he's going to make the earth a forest. And then so that the green, so that the beasts of the animals can uh, eat up all this stuff. So then he says he's, he's going to make them prosperous again. And he says it's going to be a time also when, when uh, he's going to have mercy on Israel again. He's going to have mercy on us. So then again, we can be called uh, his people, and we can call him our God. The return, the return of the relationship, return to relationship, the bond restored between the husband and and the wife relationship. And at, at that point, at that time, that's what God is is. Uh, Talking about right there. Uh, I'm gonna, because I said we're gonna get through chapter uh, three because it's only it's only five verses. So we're not gonna we're not gonna go through all those five verses. But chapter three is entitled "Hosea is reconciled to his wife." Now this thing. Now in the previous chapter, if it talks about punishment and restoration, how God was gonna punish Israel and how God was gonna restore Israel, then. You know, we're still talking about Israel, but it says in three, Hosea is reconciled to his wife. And these verses where it's, it, um, it's it's talking about where you know, uh, um, uh, Gomer. Gomer is, is an adulterous, in the real sense, in the in the real world, she's an adulterous woman. She's went out, and she's done some things. That's, maybe she's went away, and then these uh, first two verses, maybe she's went away from um, Hosea. Maybe she sold herself into slavery. Maybe she's out there living, living with a, a lover for some reason, for whatever reason, she's out there. God tells, Home. tells um, Hosea Home. to go back and buy back, buy back his wife. Remember, he gave, God gave Homer to, to Hosea. He gave it so he can show, show Israel what they're doing. So he says, go back, buy her back. 
if you think about it, you know, uh, home out there, she do out, she out there doing her thing. Everybody know it. Everybody see her. You know, all her customers out there know it. People probably talking about her, Jose. You man, you crazy to go back and take that woman back. But this is what God told him to do. God said, buy her back. If you look at it, this is what God doing us. God bought us back with the life of his son. <laughs> yeah. He did. he did. He did that with the precious blood of his son. So he says, buy her back. Restore her. Restore her back to, to where she should have, should have been all along. Restore the relationship. So he's telling uh, uh, him to do that. Uh, then we get down to verses four. Then he says, um, he tells us that there is going to be in the last, in the last verses three through five, that um, it describes a time of exile of God's people when they will be without uh, most of the things that matter to them. You know, think about it. When they go in exile, <laughs> first of all, that whoever took, whoever took charge of them, whoever captured them, took everything they had. They took the hand and put it in, put it in their house. So it, it took the land, took their, took the money and made them work for nothing. Right. It says they're gonna be without the things they were used to, the things that mattered to them. I can't see now, but you do it. I said, including their nationhood, because when they became out of captivity, they are no longer real, uh, recognized as a nation. They're recognized as captive people, just like when sin holds us down. Sin has us. Us captive, we lose all our sense of um, uh, uh, um, relationship with God because of that sin has us weighted down. It says, after this time, however, the children of Israel would return and seek the Lord. God often uses times of deprivation to urge His wayward children to return to Him. So He's gonna put God's gonna put His His children, Israel, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. He's gonna put them. He gonna put them in, in captivity. They're gonna take away everything they ever known. All think about it. Remember we we uh, studied before about the about the temple. <laughs> that means a lot. That means a lot for them. They're not gonna be able to go into the temple and worship. They're not gonna have. They're gonna be in a foreign land that have uh, their own gods. Mm -hmm. So they gonna when they think in there, when they're in that foreign land, when they're in that desert place, that wilderness, they're gonna think about how it was when they were underneath the God when God was providing for them. And all they had to do, all, they had, all we have to do, is to give God the respect and worship the one true God. So when it said, and I think the last part of that um, sentence when it says God often uses us, uses times of deprivation to urge his way with children to return to him. When um, Dr. Griffin was talking about what's going on right now, <laughs> what's going on right now, that God could be using this situation to, to get us to get the people who will say we are Christians, to get us to turn back to him, even those that that may not know who he is, to, to seek, seek to find out who he is, to find out who God is. Amen. Amen. Uh, Dr. Dillard says, yeah, he's out there in all these things, you know, who he is, so we can um, form that relationship. You know, we, our job is to to be one with God and to spread his word forward, to let his word go forward. So it shouldn't stop, shouldn't stop with us. And that's why, you know, I'm so glad we can, we can do have church service and Bible studies and Sunday school and all these formats. Yeah. So anybody, everybody out there can see that we are still a child of God and we're still praising, we are still praising God. So you don't have to be a, a member of New Mission Baptist Church just to hear, hear our pastor preach or, or whatever church to get the message through. You got to think about think about what's going on right now. They, they they are ministries who stream live all the time. You see them on TV. You see they always all the big mega churches. But there probably has never been a time again in history where as much about God has been coming out on the internet as going out right now. When we talked about going putting put people in the desert to where you have no choice but to social distancing, um, working from home, uh, staying in your house. Mm -hmm. He gets us separated to where we are by ourselves, where we have time with him, where we should be taking time 
with him. Amen. 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 Amen to that. So, you know, and not on the opposite, not on the opposite flip side, because you're doing these things, don't pull away from God. Right. It should turn, bring you closer. Turn to God. Come closer to God because it's all, because God is where our hope lies. All the hope we have lies with him. But because we have him, we know this, <laughs> that this is not it. This is it's gonna be better. It's gonna get better tomorrow. We may come out, we may come out better for this because we went through the situation. As a country, as a people, as Christians, we may come out better because we have went, we have went through this. Amen. May have pulled us closer together as a people. May have pulled us closer to God. That's what God, that's what God wants us to come to come okay. to him so that that he that out there, so that he the person out there, and I might say yeah. he the person that don't know God yeah. can see. They see how we're reacting, how we're responding to each other, even how we respond to each other in the situation that's going on all now with all with all the rioting. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of division, but we can come together. Amen. We can come together on the one common cause, and that's God. That's God. Come together under God. Amen. I, anybody else have any last comments out here before I before we wrap up with uh, what we just went through in ver and chapters two and three? Okay, well, I thank you for all your comments. I know that was kind of a rapid fire fast, but I, I wanted to get through those uh, uh, two chapters. Next week, we're going to do four and five. So go ahead, uh, make, sure you okay. make sure you study four and five. We're going to go through those. We're going to go through those uh, chapters. I want to say thank you for all those out there in the, out there on Facebook. I, I saw my sister... Uh, chimed in for the first time. Like I wow. That was exciting. Five so, you know, and, and we encourage you all to you know share. Share what you um we talked about tonight. You know, share it with share it with somebody. You never know who you may meet to ask you about what you do last night. <laughs> and you can tell them what you did last night and what you studied. I want to say hi out there to um, Minister Minister Allen and uh Reverend Allen, my sister Jackie Connie, Sister Barrows and Sister Perifor, and Marsha, and uh, the Davises, Jackie Davis and Will Davis, Sister Young, uh, Pastor and Sister Graves, the Griffiths, and the McNeils. Oh, and Brother James Shelton. Hi, how y'all doing out there? So we thank you for all turning, tuning in. Tune in next week, chapters four and five. Steady, steady so we can go forward. So before we uh, sign off, uh let's um let's pause for a word of prayer and don't don't forget when you practice to um call on somebody and check on somebody while we out there you know we're separated there's there's still a lot of people out there in our church community and in, in our in our broader communities that we can that we can check on just to let them know you're thinking about amen so if if we would Lord God, Heavenly Father, Father, thank you for the lesson that you gave us tonight, Heavenly Father. Thank, thank you, you for letting us see that you are the same yesterday as you are today, Heavenly Father, that you don't change. You are still looking for a relationship between us and us and you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for letting us see that you will, you will correct us when we're wrong, Heavenly Father. That you will do whatever it needs to bring us back in a right relationship to you, Heavenly Father. God, we know that that's where all our hope lies. We know it lies with you, Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you. We thank you for being that, that beacon. We thank you for moving in our lives, Heavenly Father. Father, we pray that that we can go out here in this world and we can, we can do something for our uh, fellow brothers and sisters, Heavenly Father. And if I, it's just to say, hi, how you doing, Heavenly Father? We can just be give them a word, Heavenly Father. Father, I pray that we can show them who you are, Heavenly Father. Father God, we just thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, we just bless your holy name forever and ever, God. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>